Well, I'm excited. If you're new, my name is Stephen, and I get to be one of the youth pastors, and we're so glad that you would make Life Church 360 a part of your weekend. And I, and I really mean that. Like, you could be a lot of different places on a Sunday morning, but you chose to be here unless you're a kid and you were forced and you got drugged here like I was when I was a kid. Um, but we are in this series, and if you're like, what is this church all about? And you're trying to figure it out, because that's what you do when you visit a church for the first time, or you've been coming for a while, and like, what is the heartbeat of this church? And really, we've come up with this acronym, LIFE, that stands for loving God, investing in others, faithfully serving, and encouraging the world. And Pastor Matt is at a volleyball tournament. He is watching his daughter Madison, and she's getting scouted by coaches, so he wanted to meet some coaches. So I get to really delve into encouraging the world. And I don't know about you, but I grew up in church, and uh, my dad was a pastor. And so every month, we had these random strangers come visit our church. When I was a little kid, I was like, oh, it's another new stranger up on the stage. I didn't know who they were. And then because I was the pastor's kid, that stranger would come over to our house, and they'd come over for lunch. Or sometimes they'd come on Saturday night, and they'd stay at our house, this random stranger, another one, and their family is in our house. Well, the older I got, the more I began to realize that these people were missionaries called by God to go around the world preaching the hope of Jesus. And as a little kid, I just remember these people. And, and still to this day, I remember Nate and Tammy Lashway who were pastors in this small community in Montana who felt the call of God to move to Madagascar. Who knew there was people there? Well, I just thought there was lemurs. And these people, like, these people, like, they're like, we feel this call of God. We just have this impression on our heart that we need to move our family. They had two little kids. We need to pick up. We're going to go to France and learn the language for a year because they speak French in Mad on Madagascar. And we're going to learn the culture and the people, and we're going to go share the hope of Jesus. I remember the Hendersons because they had two cute daughters that were my age, and they came to our house, and, and this family who, who they were just these people in from Montana who felt the call of God to go to China, knowing that if they got caught in the country of China, that they could be killed for their faith. And I remember hearing these people share their heart and their passion for Jesus and, and really understanding that the call of missions was on their heart. And, and, and I think about this lady named Mary Ballinger who's actually one of my heroes, and I don't think she even knows who I am. I just, I just remember her. She was a school teacher from Kalispell, Montana. At the age of around 20 years old, after she got her degree, she felt the call of God to go to Africa, to start a theological school to train up pastors on the continent of Africa. 50 years later, this last summer, she just retired from being a full-time missionary in Africa. She's known as the Queen of Africa, and the schools that she started in Africa have raised up 80% of, the, of the, the African pastors in the Assemblies of God, 80%. And I'm just being honest, I used to think to myself, man, that's so cool for them, right? Good for them. Like, God, that's cool that you're calling these families to go around the world to bring the hope of Jesus. Just don't do that to my family. I'm good here in Montana where we get winters. We get all four seasons. This is great. Like, I just used to think that that was for the special people who had the call of God to take, like, to take Jesus around the world. But the problem with that is I began to read the Bible when I was about 18, 19 years old, and I began to understand that the call of Jesus, the call, the, the, like Matt talked about last week, the Great Commission isn't just for the special people who are anointed and gifted with the call of being a full-time missionary. It's for everybody who calls himself a Christian. That Matthew 28 or Mark 16, wherever you want to go at the end of the Gospels, that Jesus would say, therefore, go into all the world, teaching them, baptizing them. Go into the world. And Matt talked about two weeks ago, the, the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon us in Acts 1.8. And it's a power not for our own, but to be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That we're supposed to encourage the world. And can I be honest, I didn't understand that when I started working here. I had never gone on a mission trip. And, and here's what you need to know about missions, because people all the time are like, well, okay, well, what, aren't we supposed to do stuff here as well in our community? Yes. And we're supposed to do stuff around the world. See, the kingdom of God, when it comes to the mission of God and, and, and missions, it's not just either or. It's both and. The call of God is to reach every single person to encourage. That word encourage just means to bring hope to something to su support something, to speak life into something, that encouraging the world is to bring the hope of Jesus wherever your feet go. And I didn't understand that. 
2014, I went on my first mission trip to Honduras, and I still didn't understand. I felt completely worthless on that mission trip because I did not speak Spanish. Even though I took two years of Spanish in high school, got 100% in it, I still didn't speak Spanish. And they're looking at me. These little kids are coming up to me, and they're like, I would, like, say hello, and I know just, you know, basic Spanish that everybody kind of picks up. And then, like, they'd just go, Brrr, and I'm like, nope, lost me. And I just felt like, okay, how do I encourage somebody when I don't speak their language? How do I, how do, I do this? And in 2015, I went again to Honduras, and I just like, I, I, I feel like I'm just beating a dead horse here. God, I don't know what I'm doing. 2016, I led a team down to Honduras. It was the last day of our brigade. What we would do is we would do medical dental brigades, and we would pack up all these medical supplies, and we would go to these remote mountain villages where it was very sketchy getting up the roads, and we would take eyeglasses and medicine, and we would talk about Jesus. We would have programs for the kids to hear about Jesus and have a great time, and, and you know, it was the third year in a row I've done this, and uh, our, our Spanish campus pastor, Anna Chesterfield, she is fluent in Spanish, and so she would preach, and I would talk about hygiene. I would just do basic things, and she'd translate for me, and so it was like the last day, and I, I just was like, again, I'm like, okay, God, I just don't get it. I'm just, I'm so tired, and I was wearing the same shirt for the fifth day in a row, because that's what you do on mission trips. It was awesome. You wash it in the shower with some soap, so I stunk. It's 90 degrees. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. We're getting on the buses, and it's the last day, and, and we're driving up this mountainside, and it's just like a sheer cliff on the one side, and our bus driver, Rolando, who's the best bus driver in the world, can get you anywhere in Honduras, and this bus that was probably discontinued from America and sent to Honduras... We would not let our kids ride in it, and we've packed it full, and we're taking our team up there, and we get to this place. It took an hour and 45 minutes from our village, and it was called Loma de Aguilar, which just means like Eagle's Point, is what Anna told me. And we're getting off this bus, and the translators say, hey, stop for a second. I just want to talk to the team. So the translators stop us, and they say to all of us, all, all the white people, they're like, you need to know something. For these kids in this village, you will be the first white person they ever see. I was like, oh, okay. Wow. So Anna and I, we go in, and we're in the schoolhouse, which basically it's just like an oven. Uh, it's like, it kind of looks like a prison with bars, and it's bricks, and it's like 150 degrees in there. So we're sweating, and we're doing hygiene, and Anna's preaching, and I have no idea what she's saying. I'm, I, I think it's going really well <laughs> from, from their faces. So I'm watching them, and, and then I just it was like session after session. I just began to watch people understand that Jesus came for a relationship. That Jesus came to give everybody a rich and satisfying life. And people were coming up asking for prayer to receive Jesus person after person after person. And I was just so overcome with emotion that this little kid from Anaconda, Montana could be standing in the Honduran jungle bringing the hope of Jesus. Jesus. And I went out because I was just about ready to pass out because I needed some water. And I went out to the road to grab my water off the bus. And I, I look, and there's this little boy. He's going to be on the screen behind me. This little boy was selling mangoes, which if you've had an American mango, if you've got it in our grocery store, don't even tell me that's a mango. It's not real. <laughs> Fresh off the tree, these are the, be the best fruit you'll ever have in your life. And this little kid was selling these mangoes. And it was right in that moment as I'm staring at this little boy, thinking to myself, this is what it's all about. And I want to share with you this morning what I wrote in my journal. Missions, the mission of God is not about knowing there's a need. Most people know that the world is in need and rich in poverty. What most people don't know is that the mission is about knowing in our hearts that there's a need and knowing we can and we are called to make a difference. Each person has the capability of having a, a heart moment where God shows you the true meaning of being a blessing and the significance of relationships. It may be a place, a people, or a country the Lord has placed in your heart. He wants to show us how we can use what we have been given to be a blessing wherever we go. We are all part of his creation story, and we can join him on the greatest mission of reaching people for Jesus by meeting one need at a time. That's what it is. You see a need, you meet the need if you can. And then what I followed it up with is what I want to talk about this morning because I was just in awe of God. I wrote, I can't believe this life that I get to live. 
You ever been there? You ever been in a, in a situation where you've been in awe of God that he would use you to meet a need, to be a blessing in a situation that looks so dark that you could actually be hope in somebody's life? What I want to talk about this morning is that Jesus invites you on a, an adventure of a lifetime. It's the title of the message. That Jesus invites us into this adventure of following him. And along the way, he wants to use you to share hope and be hope and be light and be love in people's life. That we're going to encourage people in our world with the hope of Jesus. And here's what I began to understand. And when Jesus said this in Mark chapter 8, 34 to 35, he said then, calling the crowds to come to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, for the sake of the good news, you will save it. So many of us, why I don't think we can understand what it means to encourage the world is because we're trying to hold on to our world. We're trying to hold on to our comfort. We're trying to hold on to the things that we can understand. We're just trying to hold on of what we think the world should look like, that life should look like, instead of saying, Jesus, I'm gonna give my life. When I began to understand that my life wasn't about me is when I actually began to live. That we could actually give, like Jesus, like if you wanna hold on to it, you're gonna lose it. But so many of us, we're living in this life and we're just holding on, just trying to make it. We're living for there and not in the moment of where God wants to use us. We're thinking, I have nothing to give. I'm not good enough. I don't have the resources. I don't have the time. I don't have this. And we can make up excuse after excuse after excuse. And so many of us are missing out on the adventure that God created us for. So many of us are missing out on that rich and satisfying life that Jesus intended for us because we're just trying to hold on instead of letting go. And saying, Jesus, what do you want to do in my life? Here's what you need to know. Being an encouragement isn't preaching a message. Sometimes it's a shoulder to cry on. Sometimes it's a hot meal. Sometimes it's a listening ear. I don't know what it is that God has gifted you at, but wherever you're at, would you just do that? Would you be an encouragement to your world? Would you allow Jesus to take you on an adventure of a lifetime where he could use you to be the very thing that somebody needs in a moment of pain and life, and you could speak hope and life and encourage people in your world. I just want to share this story this morning of the first missionary in the Bible. It's in Genesis chapter 12. His name is Abram, and and if you're new to church, the book of Genesis is the first book of the Bible. There's 66 books in the Bible. And the first one, uh, chapters 1 through 11 are the creation story, Noah, all these different people. And really what you need to know about chapters 1 through 11 is that it's poetry. And in chapter 12, it, where it really kind of changes gear and it becomes a narrative. And that, that God begins to tell his story, his people's story. And he starts with this guy named Abram. And he's, his name is later changed to Abraham, but his name is Abram. And in Genesis 12, 1 through 8, I want to share his story because I think it's the first missionary call to go. And here's what it says in Genesis 12, 1 through 8. It says, The Lord said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. Time out. So life's good. Abraham's just there. He's chilling. He's living life. He's acquired some wealth. He's been just doing life. And all of a sudden, God's like, hey, I want you to take everything, everything that you own, your family, your resources, everything, and I just want you to pick it all up, and I just want you to go. And if that was me, I'd be like, uh, where? Where? Anybody else? Uh, Where? Can you tell me where I am going? He says, no, I just want you to pick it up, and I just want you to keep walking. Literally every step that Abraham took was another step of obedience to what God had called him to do. Every step that he took was a step of obedience. It says this in verse 2. I will make you into a great nation. This is the promise of God for Abraham. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham departed uh, departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he left. 
75 years old, Abraham just picked everything up, everything that he knew, and he went and he left Haran. He took his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran and headed for the land of Canaan. When he arrived in Canaan, Abraham traveled through the land as far as Shechem. There he set up camp beside the Oak of Moreh. At that time, the area was inhabited by the Canaanites. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants. And Abram built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. You want to talk about an adventure. You want to talk about an amazing opportunity, this life that Abraham was called to do. Abraham, I want you to pick up. You're 75 years old. You have no kids. You have no descendants right now. And I want you to pick up everything that you know, and I just want you to start walking. None of you. I'm, I'm just being honest. None of us would do that. We wouldn't just pick up all of our stuff and just go. Abraham is known as the father of our faith because of every step he took was a step of obedience. And he said yes to God. See, if you read the whole story of Abraham, you will see that this guy is obedient to what God wants him to do. The reason, so, so he steps out. He's called on to this adventure, just like we're called to go, right? This isn't just like, an old, like a New Testament thing. This is an Old Testament thing too. God would call people to go. And so Abraham goes and he starts going and he says, I'm gonna use you. First, I'm gonna bless you. And you're like, time out, Stephen. I'm not blessed. Like, you should see my bank account. You should see my house. Let me snap you into reality like these ladies were talking about earlier. You live in America, you're blessed. By sheer proximity of where you live, you are blessed. If you were born here, you were blessed. If you live here, you're blessed. He says, I'm gonna bless you, Abraham, so that you can be a blessing. That's what, it, that's what it was all about, that every step, Abraham was supposed to bless people along the way. He was supposed to be obedient. And the promise that God said is that I am gonna, all through, through your faith, through your obedience, Abraham, all families on earth are gonna be blessed. What? He's like, I don't even have a kid yet. He's like, yep, yeah, don't worry about that. I know your wife's super old, you're old, but just trust me. Trust me, just trust me, okay? Every step, 25 years he waited. 100 years old is when his wife finally had a kid. And when he had the kid, when he had Isaac, he actually, like, God was like, okay, he's old enough now. We're going to take him up this mountain. You're going to sacrifice him to me. And I would have been like, what? No, what? No, what? what's going on here? And Abraham's like, okay, God. And he takes his son Isaac up on this mountain, and he gets ready to sacrifice him to the Lord. And God's like, time out. I'll, I'll, I will provide a sacrifice. You guys understand that Abraham is the father of faith because of his obedience to God? It says this in Galatians chapter 3, 8, that, that through this, what's more, the scriptures looked forward to this time when God would make the Gentiles right in his sight because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, all nations will be blessed through you. Because of what Jesus did, Jesus was through the line of Abraham, and he was the fulfillment of, of all nations will be blessed through you. And now Jesus says, now that's your turn. If you believe in him, that you're su supposed to go be a blessing in your world. And Abraham, it's his obedience that set him up as the father of faith, which leads me to this question. And I'm just gonna be really honest, I don't like this question because God asked me this question this week and I don't like it. Is our disobedience the thing standing in the way between the life that God created us to live? Is our disobedience to what God has called us to do standing in between us and the life that God wants us to live? I really, what I, what I think it boils down to is would you say yes to what God calls you to do when he calls you to do it? See, here's the sad thing for me as a pastor. I hear this all the time. I talk to people who are 40, 50 years old. Yeah, when I was 15, I heard God called me to, to be a pastor. Did you ever do anything? No. So I'm thinking about that recently. I don't know why. Yeah, when I, was, when I was a kid, I went to kids camp, and, you know, God called me this, this specific country. God laid this specific country in my heart. And I think he wanted me to be a missionary. Did you do it? No. Time and time again, I, I could share story after story of people coming up to me, missing out on what God created them for just because they wanted to hold on to their life. 
They wanted to hold on to what they thought their life should look like instead of saying, Jesus, for the sake of the good news, the gospel of Jesus, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do whenever you want me to do it. That's a life of surrender, that you would say, Jesus, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do it. I'm going to take a step of obedience when you do call me to do it. I might not understand it in the moment. It might not look like, uh, like I thought it should look like, but Jesus, when I step into my yes, when I step into obedience of what you called me to do, that's when I'm going to really begin to live and understand that this adventure that you invite me on is the greatest thing that this life could encounter is your plan for my life. That we would understand that God calls all of us to be an encourager of the world. That it's not just pastors. And I think so often as Christians we can get complacent and we begin to pray for other Christians to be the hope in our world. You ever prayed for one of your friends who doesn't know Jesus and asked God to put somebody else in their life? Come on. Lord, if you could just put somebody in their life who knows you, who really knows you. And I think God is just like, Really? I did. It's you. Just go do it. Here's what I really want you to know today is that your adventure of a lifetime starts with your yes. Your adventure of a lifetime, this life that God created you for, is at the end of your yes. Do you know that the word adventure, the root word is advent, which just means beginning? That your new beginning starts at your yes. And I don't care how old you are in this room. Abraham started at 75 years old. Yeah, he did live a little bit longer than we'll live, but he was faithful to what God called him to do in the moment. That this adventure, this life that God calls us to live starts with our yes. So how do we encourage the entire world? How do, how do we like get this message out there? How do we, through all nations, are going to be blessed through us? How do we do this? Can you just start by encouraging your world? Like your world that you live in, your family, your friends, your work, the place where your feet go all the time, your Costco, your Safeway, your Walmart, wherever God has you at, that you would be a blessing and that you would look through life through this lens of that I'm on mission. And mission is about not just knowing in here there's a need, it's about letting it travel down about two feet to your heart and acting on it. And being, meeting a need, being a blessing where God calls you to be, to be an encouragement where God calls you to be. And I'm just going to tell you, when you say yes, that the enemy is going to work overtime to send lies your way. When you step into your yes, the enemy is going to be speaking and, and trying to tell you that you can't do it, you're not good enough, you have nothing to give, you can't go anywhere. So really quick, I want to dispel three lies that the enemy might say your way. The first thing you need to know is that everyone has something to give. Stephen, I could never get up and preach a message. Yeah, probably not. If you're not gifted to do it. But maybe you're the best listener. Just be an ear to listen. Maybe you make the best chocolate chip cookie on planet Earth. Would you bake a chocolate chip cookie and take it next door? Maybe God has given you wisdom and you can speak wisdom to people's lives. Maybe that you could like be an encouragement in your world with what God has given you. And so often we get caught up on what everybody else has that it robs us of what we have. That comparison is the cancer to contentment in this life that God has given us. We get so caught up comparing our lives to other people and gifts and, and what everybody else has. God's like, use what I've given you. Everybody has something to give. Second thing you need to know, everyone can go somewhere. It can be down the street. It could be in, to Kenya, Africa in two weeks. It could be to Honduras. It could be to a place that God has specifically placed you to go. That everyone, that there's no excuse. Like, you could go next door. Yet so often we don't even know our neighbors. I'm guilty of that. I forget their names often. That God has called us to go and that everyone can go somewhere. Abraham, he just kept going until God told him to stop. Abraham used the things that he, God had given him to be a blessing in, that, in those situations. And all he did was take a step of obedience and faith every single day. That we can get so caught up living for there, we forget to be the blessing here. And what a blessing today is. 
and how God wants to use us today. Well, yeah, I can wait till Tuesday, and, and then I can preach again to the students, and that's how it can be a blessing. No. We can be a blessing here today where God calls us. Last thing you need to know, and you might be thinking, oh, man, that's cool. Everybody else can do that. Everybody else can be an encourager of the world. It's the last thing you need to know. It takes everyone. It takes the body of Christ moving together in unison, in unity, to reach the world. Jesus, the, the night before he died, prayed for us. Did you know that? Jesus, he, he prayed for himself, and then he prayed for his disciples. And then he prayed for everybody far off who would come to know him, that they would be unified as him and the Father are unified. And the reason that he wants us to be unified is so that the world would see his love in us. It takes everyone. The reason that I'm an Assemblies of God pastor is because I grew up hearing about these missionaries who would go from church to church to church trying to raise support. See, two weeks ago, Matt talked about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, and he talked about speaking in tongues, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, and that that's to empower us to go be a witness. And if you don't know the, the story of the Pentecostal movement, there was this guy named Charles Parham in Kansas, and they began studying Scripture. They kind of felt like the church was dead. Like, what's, what are we, what's going on here? Like, we need to figure this out. And they began to read Scripture, and they read the book of Acts. And they're like, man, the Holy Spirit was like poured out and we want that. And they began, the Holy Spirit was being poured out on these people. Then they went to LA, the Azusa Street Revival began to happen and the Holy Spirit was moving in the church again and it was spreading to the south and all these people in Hot Springs, Arkansas and and all these people are like, okay, now we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, now what? 1914, they came together in Hot Springs, Arkansas and came together and uh, started a denomination known as the Assemblies of God. And the reason they came together was because they realized that it was going to take everyone if they wanted to reach the world for Jesus. And what they said is, we want to be the greatest missions-sending organization in the world. That's a lofty goal. That we want to raise up, we want to train, and we want to support and send missionaries to be an encouragement to the entire world. That there are people groups still on our earth today who have no access to the gospel. They don't know who Jesus is. And we're called and compelled as Christians to go into the world however we can go. And it's going to take everyone. That's why we support Teen Challenge, because we believe in it. One of our youth pastors' life was radically changed by Jesus and Teen Challenge. We heard these stories this morning. That's why we support them, because it takes everyone. We need them. That's why we go to Kenya, Open Arms International. That's why we support 39 foreign missionaries from the Assemblies of God, from our church monthly. It's because it takes everyone if we want to take the hope of Jesus to everyone. You have to play your part in what God has called you to do. Will you take a step of obedience to what God has called you to do? One of the things that I value most in my life is that I want to live a life without regret. And what I've come to know is that the things that I regret the most are the things that I know God called me to do and I didn't do it because I know that I'm missing out on the life that's in that. That doesn't mean there's not going to be struggle in that. There's going to be plenty of struggle in that. But the thing that God invites us to do is to be an encourager, to bring the hope of Jesus, to meet a need, one need at a time, to bring the hope of Jesus so that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that they have an opportunity to hear and know Jesus. So you might be wondering, well, what do we do as a church? I want to just as we're getting ready to wrap this up, here's, here's our mission strategy. The first thing you need to know and what we really desire is that you would pray. God convicted me this week. He said, when was the last time you prayed for a missionary? Would you pray for our missionaries? We actually have a list of all 39 that we support. Would you pray that God would that would give them the funds that they need, that they would have the resources they need, that that they would be anointed and empowered by the Holy Spirit to reach the people that they're ministering to in another country? Would you pray for them? Would you pray how you're supposed to be involved in encouraging the world? When was the last time you had a conversation with God? What are you calling me to do? When was the last time you took a step of obedience into what God was calling you to do? When was the last time you prayed for God to move in you to be a blessing? that we would pray, that we would go to God first and say, God, what do you want me to do? The second thing, you would serve. So we would pray, we're going to serve. How can you encourage your world and be a blessing with what you've been given? That's it. 
How can you be an encouragement to your world? How can you be a blessing to your world where you're at? Second, you can go on a mission trip. Third, you can lead an outreach in our community. You can lead an outreach in your neighborhood. You can take our bouncy houses and you can go be an encouragement. You can bring fun. I think bringing fun is a part of encouragement. That you could go bring fun to our community. And here's the question, if you really want to know where to serve, what do you have a heart to see changed in our world? If you want to know where God might be leading you or calling you to go be a blessing, answer the question, what do you have a heart to see changed in this world? What maybe makes you tear up when you see it or you hear about it? What is it that your heart has been moving toward that you want to see changed in this world? The third thing is that you would give. Here's the reality of missions. It doesn't happen without money. I I wish it was possible. But the reality is, is that around the world, these missionaries are picking up their lives, everything that they know, and they are going into the world. And it takes money to go into the world. They, it, actually, they need resources. And, and through Speed of Light, through youth, we raise money for vehicles. And, and we support uh, people financially. We support Teen Challenge. We support Open Arms International. We support these other missionaries. But we need to support missions. We need to support missionaries. And so on your chair, there's a faith promise giving card. And all I want you to do is to ask God, do you want me to give? So this is above your tithes and offerings. This is missions giving. And would you, God, would, what would you have me give? Maybe today you were moved by Teen Challenge. You're like, I want to give to Teen Challenge. On your check today, just write Teen Challenge and all the money is going to go to them. That comes in for Teen Challenge. Maybe you would want to support our Africa mission team in two weeks. We are going to Africa. On, on every other chair is this Uh, What we're doing in Africa is that we're taking these kids from Open Arms International that we partner with. And these are kids who have been abandoned by their parents. They are orphans. And what Open Arms International does is that they come in and they give these kids a home. A mom and a dad who are actually married and they actually give them family structure. They give them education and they're raising these Kenyans up. And so what we want to do is that we want to take these kids on a mission trip, on, on on a summer camp adventure. And that's going to cost $133 per kid, just like camp costs money here. It costs money over there. And we want, to, we want to support these kids because here's one thing. Here's what my heart wants to see is that there are no more kids who don't know who Jesus is in our community. My heartbeat is that we would ha- not have to do one more service for a kid who committed suicide because they didn't understand the hope of Jesus, that they got to a place that they were so hopeless See, what motivates me every single day is that I have 10,000 kids within 20 minutes of a drive of this church who don't know Christ. And I'm so compelled that, that I believe that these kids in Kenya, that they deserve the same right to know about Jesus. And we believe that life change happens at camp and we want to provide it for them. We're going to take them away. They've never seen a swimming pool. The camp that we're going to has a swimming pool. One of my students went last year, she said, if you give them an opportunity, they will swim all day long. They would be in the pool till they are pruny, like beyond prune. We gotta give. Here's the the hard thing about this. Is it on this side of eternity, you may never see the impact that your giving has when it comes to missions. Here's what I do know. We're storing up treasure in heaven. That's what Jesus says. That our giving means so much more than we can see. Are we just trying to hang on to life? Are we going to give it for the sake of Jesus? Last thing. Would you love? Would you love your world? Would you love the people who are different than you? Would you love the people who struggle with something different than you? Would you love? Would you be love. 1 John 4.12 says, no one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. AKA, how do we make the invisible God visible to people? By loving one another. Do you love people who are different than you, speak different than you, maybe from a different culture? Would you go love the people that God has placed in front of you Because God has maybe given you his love, that blessing of receiving his love that we're going to sing about here in a second. Would you go extend it to others? 
in any, however that looks like, whatever that looks like in your life, that you would extend that love. Would you bake some cookies this week and go invite your neighbor to Easter? Would you go get to know your neighbor? Would you speak truth and life and hope into people? and be love where God's called you to be. And here's what I know. Here's our tendency is to, is to get motivated, to get encouraged to go do, and then we get back to holding on to our life. Would you surrender this morning? I'm going to invite the ushers to come and we're going to receive this morning's tithes and offering. But all week long as I've been preparing for this message, here, here's what God's put in my heart. I believe that there are people in this room who are called to full-time missions. I believe that God has maybe placed a people on your heart, a people group. He's placed a country on your heart. He's placed missions on your heart, and you've been running. And I believe that God in this moment, as I pray, wants to speak that hope into you again, that you would go be that encouragement. And as we respond with the song, don't just let it be a song with the words on the screen. Would you actually ask God, what are you calling me to do? When was the last time you just were silent and asked God to speak to you? God, what are you calling me to do? And then like Abraham, would you just take a step of obedience and say yes? Would you let your yes begin a new adventure that God wants to call you on? I just want to encourage you. Step in obedience. Don't let your obedience be the thing standing in between you and the life that God created you for. If you're new, please let these baskets go by. This is for those who call Life Church 360 their home church. We're so glad you're here. Like I said, if you want to give specifically to Teen Challenge today, write that on your check. Or if you want to sponsor a kid to go to Africa, it's $133 per kid. You can put Africa Mission Trip. Or if you just want to give, if, you just, if not, just let it go right past you. I just want to pray that God would speak to you in this song. So Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're in this place. We thank you, God, that you invite us to be a part of encouraging your world with your good news. Jesus, that we don't have to earn your love. We don't have to be good enough. But Jesus, we just have to turn to you, ask for forgiveness, and your love is like a father running after his son who ran away from him, embracing him, forgiving him, and restoring him. Lord, help us to be like that, Father, like you, Jesus, that we would go love our world, that we would bring the hope of Jesus wherever our feet go, and that we would lead with a yes when you call. Lord, I pray that in this moment that you begin to speak to the depths of our heart, that you would break down any wall that we've built up between you and us, and God, you would speak what you're calling us to do in Jesus' name.